Laura to another. Thank you, everybody. How are you doing with Alliance Building? All good? Yep. I, I, I'm not hearing much of a response there. Um, well, we're going to continue this question of alliances and more in this extraordinary opportunity we have to speak with Laura Poitras. Um, I first met her as a documentary maker documenting gentrification in a black community in the U.S. She's gone on, of course, as you know, to make a trilogy of films, um, My Country, My Country, The Oath, and most recently Citizen Four, that you'll see on Sunday morning. We don't have a lot of time with her, um, but we're going to start by letting her go through a, sh a few points that she wants to share. And, and I'll just kick off by saying that she reminds me a little bit of the French high wire artist, Philippe Petit, who when he stepped off his second foot onto the high wire between the two World Trade Towers, um, said that, yeah, he was afraid, but it was a detail. <laughs> Laura, so glad to have you with us. Thanks for coming, as it were. Why are you, you, know, not, why are you not here? <laughs> Actually, thank you so much for having me. I want to thank Gavin, especially. Um, I'm really sad I can't be there with you guys. Uh, the reason, uh, which I've said before, um, is, uh, you know, upon legal advice that, that traveling to the UK might pose some risks because of what's happened with uh, the reporting on the GCHQ and the UK Terrorism Act and Official Secrets Act and all that kind of stuff. So it's just upon legal advice that I've been told not to travel to the UK. The last time I was uh, in the UK, I was filming um, at the Guardian offices when they were publishing the Tempora story. And that was before they um, uh, they destroyed their hard drives and source material. And, and since then, I haven't been back. So I'm sad. I'm sad I can't be with you. So now the but, uh, the UK <laughs> the UK is more of a nervous making place to be than the US. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, I mean, which isn't to say that uh, the US doesn't also make me nervous. I mean, I've you know personally been on a watch list for many years and stopped every time I've um, crossed the border. But uh, but the First Amendment does give certain protections and that either you don't have in the UK, and so it does feel like it's a safer uh, place for for me to travel right now. So um, so yeah, that's the context why I'm I'm not there today. All right, good. So I, I, I was going to um, uh, maybe just go into a few um, details about how this story unfolded um, that may be relevant to, to, the, to the conference and, and these questions of the journalism and surveillance and, um, and how they come together. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, I was going to talk about that from two perspectives. One is how, um, how I communicated with Snowden for the five months before we actually met. In, in Hong Kong, and then maybe we can go into some of the, the questions about working um, with the press. But I thought, it, I think, you know, since there are many journalists there, I thought that that might be useful. So, um, so we, we corresponded for over the course of five months, and it was using um, a GPG email um, with anonymous accounts and over the um, Tails operating system. And um, the first contact I had, it, he, he'd reached out to me, um, Snowden reached out uh, anonymously to a mutual friend, Michael Lee, um, requesting my, my public key. And, uh, and, and I, um, I gave it to him. And at that point I was using, he contacted me through an email account that had my true name on it. And so we, 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 we exchanged a couple emails that way. And then he wanted to do something which we did repeatedly over the um, course of, of corresponding, which is to divorce our metadata. In other words, to set up new email accounts that were not connected to the previous ones. And, and we did that several times over the course of, of corresponding because he, he didn't want there to be sort of a link to my true name or, or any email address. And so um, we set up a new email address and the way that, um, that he wanted to verify me is he asked me to, to tweet my fingerprint and to do it through somebody else. So, so Mike, uh, Mike Lee tweeted my fingerprint and that's how he verified this, this new email address. And then we started... Um, corresponding. And I don't know how many people um, in the room have, are familiar with um, the TAILS operating system, but it's, it's what he had recommended um, early on in our correspondence to use in order to make it very difficult to, um, for any uh, intelligence agency to exploit our communication. And, um, and I hadn't actually used it yet. I was based in Berlin. I was pretty familiar with some encryption technologies I had used. I'd been using PGP the email, I'd been using OTR chat and was familiar with some things, but I'd never used Tails. And so when I was in Berlin, I reached out to some people and um, somebody recommended a person who actually I'd never met before and um, who met me 
And he chose, he, he asked me, I think early on in the correspondence, he said, who's your adversary? And I said, well, it's the NSA. And, and he said, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, that's a serious adversary. And, and we, we had a meeting and um, he didn't actually, I don't even, I still to this day don't know his last name. This is somebody who just, who met me and he set up a computer for me. And this was a computer that I had, um, I'd bought with cash. Um, I'd actually bought it in, in New York. Um, uh, when I was actually on a, uh, I was, uh, Jacob Applebaum was visiting me in New York and I was looking for, and he recommended that I should have a computer that was, um, you know, it was hard to trace to me and we bought this computer and I hadn't ever used it. And so this, I figured as I was, you know, contacting the source, I figured this was a good time to use this computer. So I set up um, this new computer that I'd never used before um, operating a tail system. And, you know, I, I thought pretty early on that, um, that the source what was going to be legitimate. I, I had a sort of a gut feeling um, and I knew that this was going to be really serious. I mean, that I, uh, that given the, you know, the disclosures that were going to be made, given the fact that I was also already on a watch list, that I had to take every precaution that I could to, to protect our communication and to protect him as a source. And so I started, um, you know, checking this email address and I would go to sort of random places where I could, you know, that weren't attached to my, my home or where I worked so there wouldn't be a connection between my sort of personal, um, uh, you know, um, Wi-Fi account and, and this computer. And we, we corresponded over the course of several months. Um, I, I was very concerned or cautious about the, the risk of it, their potential of being some kind of entrapment. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that wasn't an unfounded risk. I mean, I think what's happening right now in the U.S., we have, you know, the subpoenaing of the, of the AP or the targeting James Risen to get his source. Um, and, and then in the context of being contacted was also um, a few months after the, the story of Sabu came out, the anonymous um, and low sex member who got, um, uh, became an FBI informant and was sort of went on this um, uh, series of trying to entrap people. So I was very aware of that and very cautious to make sure that there was nothing suspicious about our communication because I thought that there was a risk that it was an elaborate entra entrapment um, attempt. Um, and uh, and then, at, you know, we, we corresponded over, over several months. I didn't receive any actual documents until right before meeting in Hong Kong. Um, uh, bef before we met, he, he did reveal, Snowden did reveal that he didn't intend to remain anonymous and that he would come forward with his identity. And when he told me that was when I, I requested that we meet in person and that, um, and that I requested that I could film with him. And he, we had a, a lengthy exchange. He had concerns about it. He didn't want to be the story, which he's been very consistent as saying. And he also was worried about the risks of us um, uh, meeting because he was worried that there was a potential that the, the reporting could get stopped if anything were to happen. So I had to provide assurances of why I felt it was important for, for him to uh, articulate his motivations and then also to provide assurances that that if we were to meet, it wouldn't it wouldn't end the reporting. Um, and then um, I traveled in 2013 and in, in mid May. I traveled to New York. Um, he'd agreed to meet. I had no idea where we were meeting, and nor did I have any documents at that point. Um, but I was pretty convinced that, it, that this was this was legitimate. And um, but I actually thought that we were going to be meeting someplace in the U.S. And I mean, it wasn't until actually you know late in, in May that that I uh, learned that we were meeting in in Hong Kong. And during this time in New York, I, I had a lot of meetings, a lot of legal meetings to find out you know what the risks were. And um, uh, you know the, what what I heard repeatedly is that. Um, that the First Amendment um, does, you know, protect this kind of journalism, but that, you know, it, 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 it's not inconceivable that the U.S. government would use the, the Espionage Act to, to target journalists. And, um, and the most disturbing case relating to this was the case of um, James uh, Rosen from Fox News, who was described as a co-conspirator in another leak investigation. And so I knew about that. And so there was a lot of conversations. I had one lawyer who said that, you know, that he felt it was probably risky for me to bring a camera. Um, and obviously that was legal advice that I, I ignored because I was clearly, that was my reason for wanting to meet was to, was to film. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there was a, there was sort of a long, um, or, or several, you know, in the period of late May, a lot of conversations with different media organizations about the risks of, of going. And during this time, Glenn wasn't, still wasn't on encryption. Um, so I was having a 
and trying to commu communicate with him and tell him sort of the urgency of coming, you know, to New York to, to travel to Hong Kong. And then finally he and Snowden were able to, to you know, get connected. And then he immediately came um, first to New York and then, and then we traveled on to Hong Kong. Um, and I think, you know, one thing I'd like to stress in sort of all of this is that um, I think in retrospect, people, you know, you know, journalists and media organizations um, think of the stories, you know, um, you know, it's a big story that they that that, um, that any news organization would want to get. And uh, but in but in truth, there was a lot of fear um, in news organizations. I mean, the Washington Post decided in the end not to um, send Bart Gelman because they were concerned about some of the risks. Um, and uh, and it, it, when we were, you know, in Hong Kong, there was, you know, a lot of concern also with The Guardian about publishing and a lot of, um, you know, to, to, you know, to really stand up to, to, to the U.S. Um, and to publish this information did, um, you know, didn't come without um, a lot of risk taking by many, many people. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know if, do, Laura, do you want to ask some questions or? Well, because it came up today in an earlier session, I'm imagining that some people might want me to press you a little bit on the comment that you made to the Daily Beast, uh, mm -hmm. where you talked about a sort of freak out there in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Want to elaborate at all? Yeah, so um, what had happened, uh, so the first reporting that we had done when we'd gone there was focusing on the NSA, and I think that the Guardian, you know, because it was the U.S. intelligence agency that they were reporting on, maybe felt that it was less um, uh, risky for them. But then, as you see, if people who see the film or will see the film, you, what happens in Hong Kong is that when you know, Ewan McCaskill from The Guardian joins us, um, uh, Snowden starts to explain to him like that the that the GCHQ is actually worse than the NSA in terms of its collection, and he starts to describe a program called Tempora, and uh, and then while well, we're in Hong Kong, he shares with um, with McCaskill documents relating to the GCHQ, and at at some point, I think those documents are part. Some of those documents made it to London, and that's when they they had a bit of a freak out, and um, and they. Uh, and a person, there was another person who came um, uh, to to uh, Hong Kong when we were there, who was helping with some technical things. And that person was um, instructed to uh, destroy some some material, but n nothing actually in the end was lost. It was. I just think that what happened once once the reporting shifted not only to the NSA but also to the GCHQ, um, the Guardian was put under enormous pressure. And you know, and and, uh, and in terms of doing the reporting, I mean, it was sort of see later that, you know, the GCHQ um, requested and, and oversaw the destruction of the hard drives. Uh, the Guardian moved their reporting and to the New York Times and, and et cetera. So, so that's the sort of context of um, that freak out. Um, two, two questions. One, I think a little bit more detail on when you say you were very aware or, or looking out for anything suspicious to protect yourself from possible entrapment. I think the audience might appreciate a little more detail on that. And then I have a question about your decision. You know, many people imagining that maybe a Pulitzer was in their future um, might not have decided to share mm -hmm. this yeah. leak. Uh, okay. You did with, with Glenn, and that speaks to the question of alliance building that we're dealing with here. Why? Sure. Um, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, the whole, um, the fact that, that Snowden reached out to me, I mean, I'm, I, I really define myself as a visual journalist, as a documentarian, and this was clearly a print story. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, one journalist print story. It was, you know, it's a big print story. And so uh, for a number of reasons I teamed up. One is because I felt as a, as a visual journalist, I needed to work with people who um, you know who who were working in print and also had who had sources and 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 that it needed to go into sort of a newsroom editorial process that that seemed you know I'm, a, I'm an independent filmmaker I you know I have a, a, a small you know I have one one person that I work with and then you know editors and stuff but not really people who are sort of set up to deal with this kind of a, a, of a leak so it's clear that I needed to partner up and then I think also because I'm not really a def you know my my background isn't so much in, in with any particular organization. I work independently, so I've I broadcast with many different organizations um, and and outlets. So I don't feel this sort of uh, sort of unique loyalty to one particular outlet. I mean, my loyalty I felt was always to the story, and you know whoever published was good. So if another you know um, Ryan Gallagher just did a great story for the Intercept, and I'm you know that's great news. I don't feel um, that I've or I've never felt in in working on this that I've been 
I've been scooped. I mean, my my frustration is more is how to scale the reporting, how to get more information out. And and I think it's partly because, you know, I just don't, I'm not really, I didn't kind of move up in, from a print newsroom background. And so I didn't feel a sort of proprietary um, uh, relationship to breaking stories. I certainly have felt an obligation to getting the information out and then also a certain obligation to making sure that um, you know the security of the of the material. I mean, I've, I've I have been concerned about that, and and I think that there's you know that there's been a bit of a push pull because I I do wish we had scaled more and, and have been been able to report report more quickly. Um, and uh, so I don't know. So those are I think the, some of the factors that that play into the fact that I I've you know brought in other people to work on on this story. And the suspicions of entrapment. Oh, the, the suspicion stuff. So, I mean, uh, I mean, there are, I think a lot of people in the room might remember the case of Sabu. I mean, this was somebody who was, um, you know, really, um, you know, was active on anonymous and Lulsec and 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 was, you know, became an FBI informant. And I just. And I just thought, like, this was the landscape that we're moving in right now. And at that point, you know, I had been on a watch list for many years. I was filming with several people who were under investigation by the U.S. So that included, I've been filming with um, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. I've been filming with um, William Binney, an NSA whistleblower, and Thomas Drake. Um, and Tom Drake was, um, uh, was uh, uh, you know, under investigation, charged under the Espionage Act, and then ultimately the government dropped those charges. And I'd also was filming with Jacob Applebaum. So these were, so, so I thought that there was a chance that they would maybe try to entrap me or entrap people that I was spending time with. And so I was just very careful that there weren't, weren't any suspicious requests, you know, and, um, and, you know, and I, and I posed that in, early on in our email correspondence, I said to, to Snowden, who's obviously name I didn't know at that point, I said, how do I know you're not crazy? How do I know you're not trying to entrap me? Um, and, and, and why are you contacting me, you know, because I'm a filmmaker and I was a bit taken aback because I don't get lots of cold, you know, cold contacts out of the blue. And, uh, and he said, in terms of entrapment, and he said, you know, you know that I'm not trying to trap you because I'm never going to ask anything of you. And he, you know, he, I think appreciated my paranoia or my concern or skepticism in our dialogue, because I think it's some, it's, it's a mindset that he, I think shares. Mm. Um, I want to ask about the relationship of this last film with, and subject matter with your previous two in the trilogy. Can you talk about what you see the links to be? Sure. I mean, so I've been trying to document post 9 11 America and policy um, from a sort of on the ground perspective. I, I, I film, I mean, all my films are done cinema verite, so they happen sort of as events are unfolding. So there's kind of capturing of history. I'm interested in, in creating primary documents of history. Um, and I'm also interested in how do you translate the, you know, the abstraction of the war on terror into human terms and, and hopefully to to communicate differently. I think that visual journalism can do, can be impactful in a different way than print can. And I think that it can communicate some of the human costs of, of what's going on with the U.S. foreign policy. Um, uh, you know, the, the films, um, I didn't set out to make um, a trilogy because I actually never imagined that the U.S. would still be at war, you know, 13 years after 9-11. Um, I you know the first film was about was about the Iraq War, which I felt was a very frightening precedent to occupy a country to bring democracy and to use preemptive force because you think somebody, a country might be doing your harm. Um, and I just thought it was a sort of a new era, um, uh, sort of a, uh, you know, sort of post-Cold War era. And, uh, and then in making that, uh, in editing that film, I... I kind of realized that this was going to be an ongoing series of films. I mean, Guantanamo was the next film that I made. And, um, you know, as a U.S. citizen, I think that um, historically this is going to be, you know, understood as a, you know, national um, tragedy, nightmare, whatever you want to call it, that we have a, a prison where people can be held over, you know, over a decade with never being charged with a crime. And so, so the, you know, the motivation that was just, is to provide some kind of primary documentation, like on the ground, I'm interested in being in places where things are happening in real time. Mm. Um, and then, you know, this uh, Citizen Four, you know, I was really interested in how how the war on terror was being played out in, in the U.S. or in the West. And, and surveillance has been, you know, mass sort of use of mass bulk surveillance is what, you know, happened immediately after 9-11, you know, as they were preparing to 
um, invade Afghanistan as the US was preparing to do that. They were also preparing moving in servers into the NSA to spy domestically on US citizens. So these things happened kind of simultaneously. And I was very interested in trying to document that. And then, you know, the fact that I'm also, you know, have been put on a watch list meant that I was, you know, particularly, I think, um, interested or sensitive to um, what that means, you know. I mean, for, certainly for me, as a, as a journalist, it, you know, poses real, you know, constraints. I mean, I moved to Berlin to protect source material. And, um, and so I thought it was important to, to try to tell a story about that. And, um, and I set out to do that. And, and I think when I first started focusing on it um, was... You know, there, there, there were certain, there were a lot of people who were, you know, uh, making warnings about what were happening. People, including, um, including Julian Assange, including Jacob Applebaum, including you know William Binney and the other NSA whistleblowers. But it, it there was a question of how do you, um, yeah, communicate that more broadly, mm -hmm. and you know, and and fate intervened, and I got these you know emails from Snowden. Um, I just have two questions, two more questions, and then I'm going to come to the audience. So audience folks, get ready with your questions. Just to get to two last points, I do a, a TV show called Grit TV, where we talk to people with grit, and, and you talked about what's happening on the ground. I just came from the States where what's happening on the ground is a kind of national uprising against the militarization of the police and the racism of the police. Uh, my question to you is those communities, particularly communities of color in the United States, would say there has been a war waged on them since slavery, uh, a terrorizing war. Yeah. Who do you think is going to be the front line of resistance if what we're talking about here is as much a political problem and a, poli a, a, a question of a problem of power as it is a problem of technology? I mean, uh, I mean, I think you're totally right. I mean, um, you know, I often talk about sort of, po well, I've been working on this question of post-9-11 um, post America and policy. And, you know, you're right to say that, you know, the, the, history, the, the, the history of the U.S. is a long history of violence. It's not, it's nothing new. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's not a surprise. But I, but, I, but I am interested in certain shifts that have happened after 9-11 and where things that, you know, that we didn't ever expect happening. So for instance, for me, like the legalization of torture, that there are actually memos being issued by the executive branch about how to legalize torture. I mean, that does seem like it's a, a departure. But in terms of how people will um, respond to um, or, you know, sort of shift course, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I feel like, you know, the work that I do is sort of focusing on, on exposing what's, what's happening and maybe, you know, I'll, the organizers We'll have the answer for that. I actually don't know that I have those answers. <laughs> Finally, you. Um, you, st without spoiling the end of the movie for people, that the movie does end with you getting validation um, in your experience of having been on the watch list. Mm -hmm. Talk a bit about what this has all been for you personally and what your life is like now in Berlin. I mean, like on a personal level, um, on one hand, you know, this has definitely been the the scariest film I've ever made. Like, I'm, I'm very aware I mean, of that we're in, in, angering, you know, people who are, you know, really powerful and who operate, you know, in the shadows. And, and I felt a lot of fear making this film um, and working on this reporting. And uh, on the other hand, uh, being in Berlin has been extraordinary. I mean, I've been, I, the, the uh, people have made the film with the, my artistic collaborators. It's been a joy. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm, I actually, you know, I feel that, you know, there was a kind of coming together of people who are willing to take risks, who are, I guess, um, you know, feel that there are certain things that are happening in the world that are simply wrong and that are um, and coming together and forming community. And that's actually a great thing. So, so being in Berlin on one hand, you know, was necessitated by the, you know, sort of um, being, you know, placed on a watch list. It's actually, um, I'm, you know, incredibly happy to, to be based there and to be working there. So you'd encourage people to follow your tradition. <laughs> Let's take some questions. I'll, I'll take one, two, and is there a woman with a question? Come on now. All right, I'll take two, and the next one I'll be aggressively affirmative active. Okay, behind you, right there. They're just being taken the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. They're just being taken the mic. Okay, question is coming. It's Masato Kimura, Japanese freelance journalist based in London. I watched uh, your movie, uh, Citizen Four, and uh, 
my question is about the difference between the Guardian and the Washington Post. And the uh, Guardian sent uh, Greenwald and the Macaque through to Hong Kong, and they drilling uh, Snowden uh, for a long time. And uh, on the other hand, the Washington Post uh, didn't send reporter to Hong Kong. And uh, it's like a free ride for scoop. And you write an article on, on behalf of the uh, Washington Post. It's very strange for me. And what is your opinion? It's uh, just a uh, um, strategy for you and manipulate uh, Guardian and uh, Washington Post. Oh, okay, I'm not sure I get the full question that, that, that it's that I published in both papers. Even though the Post didn't send anyone to Hong right. Kong. Okay. So, um, so I began um, in May. Um, Snowden said that he wanted to um, release one story early. I didn't know what the story was, and he asked for some recommendations of reporters, and I gave him many, um, actually including Cy Hirsch, who I think is there with you. Um, uh, but the one person I actually had an um, encrypted com um, connection with was Barton Gelman. And so I, I asked if he'd be interested in working on this one story, and that was in May, and then he became involved. And and so with that one story, I, I decided that it probably made sense um, that I would do that with the Post. And at the same time, I was in this complicated um, position of trying to get Glenn to come to New York, but Glenn didn't have encryption, so I didn't want to say too much. And I felt that at this time, it was at the moment of like the highest risks um, that if I made a mistake in terms of um, communication that, um, you know, it was at a point where I didn't have any documents, but that um, it was clear that the source had taken all these risks. And so I was being very cautious about what I could say to Glenn. I kept saying, we need to talk. And I tried to get him um, a, a tails disc. I tried to FedEx it. Actually, Mike, Michael Lee sent something to him in Hong Kong and it got held up in customs. And I was in this, this, um, this sort of limbo because I didn't want to travel to Hong Kong alone. I felt that that would be a mistake for, for a number of reasons. One, because I felt this was really a print story. And that also um, I I felt it needed to go through an editorial chain and that it was, you know, not something that I felt that I had the capacity to do alone. And I felt it posed lots of risks. So I, I definitely felt I, I wanted um, to partner on, on this story and, uh, and then had a meeting with the post and they were going to send, we were going to go and then they pulled out. And then I was in this kind of limbo phase when I couldn't reach Glenn or I couldn't reach Glenn with encryption and the post had pulled out and the post lawyers were telling me, you know, that they advised me not to go. Um, and I actually reached out to the New Yorker during this, um, during these few days and to try to see if they wanted to send someone. I, I um, talked um, about if, if Cy could go or Jane Mayer or something. It was just a bit of a crisis moment. And then Glenn did finally get in contact with um with the Guardian, um, and uh, and you know, in terms of why I bylined there, I mean, this it was a story that I that I did bring to the Washington Post, so that's why I bylined with them. And then once Glenn um, got on encryption, and he immediately, I mean, without you know, you know, I think the, the same day got on a plane and was in New York, and then we were um, heading to Hong Kong. So that's how it happened. And then um, once I was there, then I published um, the, uh, you know, the story in the videotape with, with the Guardian. And, um, you know, and I really, you know, feel that uh, I do have some criticisms of, of some of the Guardian's decisions in this reporting, but I think that they were incredibly bold um, in, in their initial reporting while we were in Hong Kong. And I think it has, you know, largely to do with, with, um, with Glenn. Question number two coming up. Hi, Laura. Uh, Jeremy Zimmerman here. Hey. Hey, um, um, I'm fascinated as a politically minded hacker uh, by uh, how you're empowered through technology. Uh, mm. But I must say that even here in, in this wonderful event with some of the brightest minds thinking about the, the issues, uh, presentations and communications are done with Apple hardware and software. Uh, somebody earlier recommended using Skype uh, for security reasons, actually. Um, and. No, no, I, I'm, 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 well, we, we even heard that what really matters for users, sorry, people, is the very good interface. Um, when uh, you and I know that uh, uh, political aspects, uh, a humanism vision of technology uh, and ethics matter more than the interface. And the same way we do not wait until language is perfect and easy before we learn it. 
Uh, what are your tactics, other than leading by the example, to, to convey that to your fellow journalists? Yeah. How do you convey this empowerment through technology? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think in terms of, uh, I mean, that's, those are great questions. I, I mean, I do think that one, th one of the um, effects of, of this story is probably a lot more journalists have, have learned to use encryption, not just because they care about source protection, which I hope they do, but I also think that they want to be prepared if they were ever got a knock on the door. Um, uh, you know, and I do think that there's a threat model question. I mean, I'm guilty right now, I'm on a Macintosh. And the reason, you know, it doesn't make, you know, some of my friends that happy, uh, you know, but I'm a filmmaker and an editor and actually uh, it's travel to computers all the time is a bit difficult and, and I do rely on certain um, tools for doing my work, particularly editing software that doesn't exist in an open, you know, in free software. Um, I don't know of any, you know, robust editing um, uh, software. So, so I do some, in some case, I, you know, rely on um, technology that I don't fully trust and don't really always want to endorse. Um, but I, but I think that when it actually comes down to, you know, at some point it becomes a question of what is your your threat model versus what you need to accomplish. And, and I think when it comes to actually trying to protect sources that, you know, we have an obligation to use technology that we, that we feel to be secure. And, and you know, I'm, I, I believe that, you know, I, I won't use, um, you know, for instance, OTR on this computer because I actually don't trust it, that it's not exploited, you know. Um, and so I, 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 I simply won't communicate with it, um, with any, any, um, any source related information. So, but, um, but I think in a way, you know, the challenge is, I think on, on you right now, right, to build tools that will, um, uh, you know, that people like me can use. And, you know, I have to say that I, although I did figure out how to, you know, get tails running, it wasn't an easy, there was a learning curve. And I, I had enough information to know that it was essential, but not every journalist does. And it wasn't easy even for somebody who um, is technically inclined and so I, I do think that it's important to that we that we focus on building tools that that are easier to use and don't require such a, a you know um, a steep learning curve yeah. here she comes I, I'm Beatrice Edwards from the government accountability project and I, I just I wanted to ask you something about the international aspect of all of this that you're in, um, you're based in Berlin where you seem to be safe. Um, the United States has the First Amendment that protects some kinds of speech. Uh, the UK is dangerous. Uh, Snowden went to Hong Kong, then to Russia. <laughs> Venezuela and Ecuador have given asylum to Snowden, to Assange, but they can't get there. Um, some of us here are trying to put together an, a framework for protecting whistleblowers and journalists internationally. Have you any thoughts about how that would work? That is, clearly we seem to have to get beyond the national legal regimes, although I'm sure you've got more lawyers than you can count. Mm. I mean, uh, it's hard to know, I mean, because some of these things are so case-specific, right? You know, like I when after um you know i had legal advice about the publishing that i was doing but i was in berlin um that i that i saw it from u.s lawyers but when david miranda was detained under the terrorism act in the uk then i realized like wow okay i'm in the european you know union like then i started to have have to have legal meetings about what the risks of extradition or were, were there any risks that you know that, the, that britain would you know issue a, an extradition warrant for me in germany and you know uh, and I, I, in terms of, I mean, I think that we, you know, need to look at those kinds of laws. I mean, I think that, you know, the way in which um, terrorism is being used to um, allow for, you know, all kinds of laws um, that that sort of seem to bypass what we think of as, you know, basic due process. So I think that there needs to be sort of a, you know, understanding or, or, or you know, challenging of how those of those laws so that it, it doesn't create the same kind of exposure in, in a situation like this. I mean, um, you know, where terrorism laws are used to target um, people who are engaged in journalism. More questions there. Coming up. 
Hi, Laura. This is uh, Eva Blumdimonte from Privacy International. Uh, I was just wondering, because it seems that uh, the harshest reactions have actually come from the UK, be it with the Miranda case, the description, the destruction of the hardware at The Guardian. And I was wondering, how do you, how do you explain that? Do you, think, do you think that's something that's actually manipulated by the US, or do you think there is m much more of a desire here to actually protect uh, intelligence agencies? I mean, I don't know. I mean, is there anyone from the UK who wants to respond to that? Um, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, your analysis is clearly right. I don't think it's necessarily manufactured by the US, um, but certainly the, the, it's been, the response has been um, the most, um, you know, uh, I think, <laughs> I guess, anti-free press and, and, you know, really attacking, you know, the, the reporting in a way that we haven't seen um, in the same level to in the US. I mean, I think that there are certain things that lead to it. I mean, you have the fact that the uh, the, the D notices were issued to all um, uh, UK outlets, which are the sort of voluntary censorship, you know, um, uh, process where you know you know the BBC doesn't re report on a on a big story reported by the Guardian because you know the, the government has asked them not to. I mean, it's, to me, that's something that would not happen in the U.S. context. I mean, I'm I'm certainly critical of U.S. mainstream media, but I can't imagine the sort of voluntary um, you know self censorship in that kind of way that 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 a story like this wouldn't get um, uh, reprinted. Um, but, but actually, you know, I'm, I, I should say that I, I, perhaps that's not fully true because, I mean, you know, the U.S. media didn't use the word torture for, you know, uh, to describe torture. So um, so I don't know. Maybe there's something in the room who can, who can give a, a better answer to the U.K. context. I mean, the New York Times didn't publish the story about listening until after an election. They held it for almost a year. Right. No, no, no you're right. You're right. You're right. But, uh, um, yeah. Uh, you're right. <laughs> I'm sorry to be harping on. Yeah. Go. Okay. Hello? Oh, yeah. You're right. Hi, Laura. My name's uh, Kate Holly. I'm a TV journalism uh, student. Um, and I was wondering, um, since you're working with a visual medium, um, how do you square the facts with uh, telling a story? So you're, you're creating a narrative structure. So mm -hmm. do the two compete or does it come natural to you? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, visual, you know, journalism, you know, shares, you know, many things with print journalism. I mean, you need to have your facts right and you need to fact check and all those kinds of things. And um, but they do depart at some point and they can it, they can accomplish different things. And, um, you, you know, for me, like, I, I think that, I mean, you know, for instance, if we um, the uh, we look at the Abu Ghraib photographs, that that Cy Hirsch was the person who who exposed first. I mean, th there had been reports in the press that there was that, that there was an investigation going on in in um, in Iraq, uh, but nobody picked it up. It wasn't really a story until until you have the sort of visual you know evidence of what's happening. And so when I'm, I'm constantly you know in terms of my work trying to figure out how you know through um, visual means you can communicate things in different kinds of ways and you know even information that we might already have like um, I mean there's a lot of things that we um, that you know populations know that are happening in the world that we maybe don't spend a lot of attention um, on but if you're if you can understand it in a different way or make it really connect to people then it does shift um, how that information is is received and the impact it can have have so I don't know it doesn't it, it does feel natural to me I mean that's you know the, the direction that I go in I mean I, I really do define myself um, uh, first and foremost as a visual journalist Should I take two more something like that coming coming thank you hello um, uh, TV journalism uh, master too. So uh, my question is, because of um, the threats and the surveillance that you are facing now, do you think that it's still possible for you to be uh, an investigative journalism, or you do you do you have to reconsider there your future? I mean, uh, I mean, one of the lessons we've we've learned from Snowden disclosures is that actually encryption does work. So if you if you know what you're doing, you can communicate um, uh, privately. And so I don't feel like that because I'm targeted, I can't continue to do my work. Um, but obviously, um, you know, I have a much higher profile now, right? I mean, I think that that's that's pretty obvious. And and in a way, it's too soon to say 
you know, how it will impact my work. Um, I, I don't know yet. Um, and, but I do feel that, you know, that I'm capable of, of having, you know, commun secure communications with, with a source and protecting a source. But I do think that, that there, there will be new challenges, obviously, because um, I'm certainly on the radar in, you know, not just for US intelligence agencies, but for, you know, other governments. Hi, I'm also a documentarian, as you call it. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, if you can answer this, but uh, what do you do with the raw material? How do you, uh, how you, keep, how do you keep it safe when you yeah. have filmed? And, yeah, uh, and the hard disks? So, so with the material, I mean, I started, um, when I started filming, I, um, I started keeping all my footage outside. I didn't cross the U.S. border with it um, at some point. But with, when I went to Hong Kong, I, I actually took more precautions. Um, I, I had, you know, multiple encrypted hard drives. And I, as I was shooting at the end of each day, I was backing up and making sure one hard drive was getting out of the hotel room. Um, I had a contact locally um, and then physically with the SD cards um, because you can't record with encryption to to the physical medium um, then I was physically destroying those every day in in Hong Kong because I was very concerned that we the uh, the uh, we could be raided and that and that everything could be taken so so I had everything backed up. Um, I'm sort of religious about backing up. I think it's, you know, it's, it's essential. Um, and, and then I left um, uh, the film that I shot. There's one copy um, I left in Hong Kong and then I traveled with the other. And then when I actually was ready to travel, I didn't book my flight ahead of time. I just showed up at the airport and bought a ticket immediately because I wanted to, to you know, kind of close any kind of window in which I, I might be, um, you know, stopped trying to, to leave the country. And another thing I did while traveling is I, um, I carried, I had a small portable printer because I knew I wanted to be able to ask questions, um, but I didn't want to be sort of going to any kind of public print, you know, um, copy shop or something to, to print any of these kinds of questions because I knew they'd be sensitive. So, so I was traveling with a printer and then obviously I, I um, you know, I work with multiple computers. I, I, I have one that's, you know, air gapped. I have one that's, you know, that's secure for communication. That's a non Macintosh. And then I have um, one that I use or more media, which which is a Macintosh because it has the editing software that I use. Um, so, um, you know, that's kind of a, a broad range of, of, of how I, um, you know, secured material. Can you tell us anything about your next project or where your next chapter of your journey takes you? Um, you know, I'm going to do something um, for a museum. So I'm going to, you know, work with some similar themes that I've been working on, but in a less... Um, in a narrative kind of way, and and then also there's a, um, quite a bit of material that that I filmed for this project that you know I learned in the editing room would would be part of a different project. So I'm, I'm continuing to produce that. What? Sorry. Oh, uh, Laura. I guess my last question is about what you've learned in all of your work about the consequences of what the NSA and its fellows are doing. Um, you felt it yourself. You documented it a lot in, in the oath. But do you think they have any idea the blowback they're brewing? How do you mean? Can you uh, tell me what you mean? In terms of the ex this, people like yourself who've been on these watch lists, people who've been surveilled, people who've been treated as many have in the work that you've done, um, there's a reaction, as there is now a reaction inside this community. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, I do think like in a strange way being put on a watch list made me a bit resilient and, you know, ready to, to handle this story. And in a certain way, you know, I mean, I think Snowden learned from other whistleblowers. I mean, he learned from what happened to Chelsea Manning, he learned what happened to Thomas Drake, and then he made choices that, you know, you know, see, I think that there are people who, who feel like that there's certain things that are happening um, that should be, um, you know, confronted. And that, um, and and that will will take risks, and so I think we're seeing that, and in many different um, you know uh, avenues. Uh, so I think that that yeah that is the case. But I, uh, you know, I mean, right now, I, I I think that you know that's partly the good news, right? Like that 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 people are willing to take risks to expose um, you know injustice or wrongdoing. Perfect. We wanted to end on a good note, positive note. Mm -hmm. Laura, thank you so much. Laura Poitras.
Thank you.